Well, we've been in this series called Masks, and we've been talking about how that we hide behind masks. And the Bible tells us that he who covers his sin will not prosper. But if we confess our sins to one another, if we are in community with one another, it helps us overcome. It helps us get better. Uh, in James chapter 5, it says that if we will confess our sins, if we confess, then we'll be healed. And there's all kinds of implications to that. But the point is this. God does not want us to hide behind a mask. He wants us to be authentic. He does not want us to pretend, but he wants us to be real. And I think today especially, and we've always needed this, but especially today, we need real Christianity. Not fake, not pretend, not putting on the Sunday mask when you go to church, but rather authentic, real uh, Christianity. Well, today we're going to talk about removing the mask of shame, of shame. Now, what is it about shame? Um, the fact is, when we, uh, we all have shame, and I love how Jesus, throughout the Gospels, removed shame from people so that they could come into relationship with him. He was an expert at removing shame. Do you remember the first miracle that Jesus ever did? It was turning water to wine. It was at a wedding. And he said, what's so big? Uh, why is that such a big deal? Well, in that culture, uh, if you ran out of wine, that was a, beyond a social faux pas. You would never recover from that. And they ran out of wine, probably a poorer family, and they didn't have enough money uh, to have enough wine. They were hoping that it would last, but it didn't. They ran out. And what did Jesus do? He turned water into wine, probably some uh, 800 bottles of wine. It was, um, it was uh, about 10 water pots with about 20 gallons or so each, which would make somewhere around 800 bottles of wine. And the governor of the feast said, you know, remember what he said? He said, you've held the best stuff until now. Nobody does that. And, and when you think about what Jesus did, if we were to put it, just so you understand the magnitude of what he did, uh, if we put it in the, in the culture that we live in today, buying the best wine uh, at a wedding to cover the shame, to recover your reputation, not to be embarrassed, probably the value of what Jesus did in our culture today would be about a quarter of a million dollars worth of wine. Now think about this. When Jesus does something, he does it right, okay? And he removes the shame, and I love this about him. We don't have the power to remove our own shame, but Jesus does. And, and when we try to remove our own shame, we do it in ways that the Bible says it just simply doesn't work. We try to deny it. Uh, you know, when we deny the shame by trying to justify what we've done, we drive the shame deeper. We don't cure it, we drive it deeper. It gets worse. Um, we live in a culture that does that, do we not? I mean, the fact is, people today, they want to say, well, I am being empowered. But they're not. They're living in shame and they're driving it deeper by denying what they're doing. And let me just give you an illustration. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I had an evangelist in town We've had him preach at this church before, but I was pastoring another church at the time. Uh, Tim Lee, he's the evangelist that lost both of his legs in the Vietnam War, and he was coming to preach for us, and I had picked him up at the airport, and I was taking him to this hotel. And it was a very weird thing that happened because these giant buses pulled up while we were checking into the hotel, and here's what they said on the side of the buses, Miss Nude... America. Miss Nude America. And off these buses piled these women that were the strippers that were a part of this Miss Nude America contest. And a lot of people were like, oh, what did they look like? To be honest, it was heartbreaking. I remember not being like, oh, I'd like to see that girl naked, but rather I'm so sad for her. 
If you were able to see the looks on their faces, if you were able to see how haggard they were, if you were able to see how troubled they obviously were, here's the thing. If you talk to them individually, they were like, I'm about female empowerment. I'm taking control. I'm in control of my own body. But what they did not realize is in that trying to remove the shame. And many of them were on drugs and, and, and so on and so forth. And look, I, I do know that just by looking at them, and I don't know all their stories, okay, I'm not suggesting that I do, but I think it's an illustration of how that when we try to remove the shame by justifying the things that we're doing, it drives it deeper. It doesn't cure it. And today we're going to read a story about a woman that they were going to throw rocks at, okay? You got your rock? Everybody hold your rock up. Keep your rock. All right, because I'm going to tell you what to do with the rocks in a moment. John chapter 8 is a story about Jesus uh, when he was confronted by the Pharisees when they brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Now I have a question. How can you catch a woman in the act of adultery without catching the man also? Oh, no, it's just a question. They didn't bring the man. John 8, 1, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. So he's in the temple, in the courtyards. And he said, a crowd gathered soon, and he sat down and taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Okay, now we know they were not interested in justice because of what they did. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Well, once again, where's the dude? All right. The law of Moses says to stone her. Everybody hold up your rock. Everybody hold up your rock. It says to stone her. What do you say? What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus, and I love this, this shows his mercy, his grace, the fact that he can remove the shame. He stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. No, the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote. I heard one preacher say it this way, Jesus was writing love letters in the sand. That's beautiful, isn't it? I don't know what he's, maybe he was writing names that only the accusers knew. Dates, events, that they didn't think anybody knew. The shame in their own life, the sin of their own past. I don't know what he was writing, but he began to write. And they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, in the brilliance of Jesus. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down and wrote in the dust again. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. And beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. By the way, if you think that Jesus was condoning her sin, he was not. That's the reason he said, go and sin no more. And Jesus knows that the only way to deal with our shame is through repentance and through getting uh, that relationship with God, understanding forgiveness and understanding what God has given to us through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Well, the question I want to ask you today is this. What will you do with your rocks? Now, we read this story about a group of men that wanted to stone to death this woman who was called in the act of adultery. There are really just three things I want to tell you. Number one, you can be hurt by a rock. There were accusers that were wanting to stone her, that were wanting to kill her. And when that happens, you can feel shame from your actions. I'm sure the woman was embarrassed. 
I, I'm sure she felt shame from what she got caught doing. She was probably a lot of other things, a lot of other emotions. She was probably angry. She was probably wondering where the man was. She was probably wondering why they were just putting her out there, trying to make an example of her. But she was hurt by her actions. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what that means? It means all of us have sinned. It means you have sinned. You can talk about all the empowerment that you want, but until we acknowledge that our sin is not only deep, but it causes a broken relationship with God, there is no healing. There is no overcoming the shame. There is no getting better until we understand that our sin was so bad and so desperate that Jesus literally became human and died on the cross for our sin. Romans 6, 23, the payment of sin is death. But the gift that God freely gives is eternal life found in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does that mean? Do you remember all the way back in the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden? Do you remember what God told Adam and Eve? He said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the day that you do, what did he say? You will die. Now, did they die immediately physically? No, but they died spiritually at that moment. Um, John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Because of the sin of Adam, here's what God needs you to understand. Everyone has sinned. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. Everyone feels condemnation and shame from their actions from time to time. I don't care who you are. There are things that you have done that you hope nobody ever finds out about. You, you ever been a teenager before? Anybody in here ever been a teenager before? You know what I'm talking about, right? I can remember things that I did as a teenager. And do you ever have a guilty conscience? Uh, maybe you do now. Maybe you weren't just a teenager at that time. But I can remember every time my dad came in the house, I was like, oh no, he found out. And I was just terrified. I was ashamed of what I'd done. And you probably have felt that. But the truth is God wants us to understand that we are condemned already. Why? Because we're born in sin. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men because all have sinned. That's where death comes from. It comes from sin. It's not, it's not you know, just a, a law of nature. It is from sin. So you can feel shame from your actions, but everybody hold your rock up. You can be hurt by the rocks, but you also can be, you can feel shame from your accusers. We read the scripture earlier, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. That is describing what God sees when you will stand before him and the devil is trying to accuse you and saying, he's no good, she's no good. If you really knew how many times she failed or how many times he failed, God says, no weapon, no tongue is going to rise against you. It's not going to prosper. It's not going to be successful. Why? Because your righteousness is not from you. It doesn't matter if you went to church every Sunday. You can join every church in the county. You can get baptized in so many creeks that every tadpole in the county knows your name, all right? That is not what overcomes the sin. That is not where your righteousness comes from. God says, your righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So what do you do? Well, you can feel shame from your accusers. They're going to be accusers. They're going to be people that say things about you that are not true. They're going to be people that try to hurt you. You can be hurt by the rocks. We all have rocks. We've all been hurt. We've all been disappointed. We've all had somebody that let us down. We, some of you, as you grew up, there was deep emotional wounds. Sometimes you don't even know about Maybe there was something that uh, in your family, maybe, maybe you were abused as a child. And there's deep 
sorrow and scarring and hurt on the inside. Maybe you felt abandoned. I mean, we could sit here, and I'm not a psychologist, but we're gonna, we can talk about every one of us has been hurt. Some of you were hurt in marriage. You had a spouse that left you. Some of you were hurt with your kids. You have a broken relationship with your kids. Some of you have a broken relationship with your family. Some of you have been fired unjustly from at work. And I could just go on and on and on. We've all been hurt. Jesus said it this way, it is impossible but that offenses will come. You're not going to get through this world, and can I just say in love to our younger people, uh, there is no promise of a safe space, <laughs> okay? The fact is you're going to be hurt, and that is reality. And what do you do with it? What do you do with your rocks? The good news is that you can be freed from your shame by Jesus. That's where it comes. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by God's grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gifts so that no one can boast about it. God doesn't want you bragging about how good you are. He wants you to brag about how good Jesus is because he is good. I love the fact that Jesus just stooped down and wrote love letters in the sand. Where are your accusers? No one, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Well, you can be hurt by a rock. Everybody hold your rock up. No way else you can do with a rock. You can throw a rock. You can throw it. These guys tried to. Why do you throw rocks? Well, in this case, they threw rocks because of an agenda. They wanted to trap Jesus. Have you ever had an agenda? Have you ever thrown a rock at somebody when they maybe didn't deserve it because you had a selfish agenda. Why did they throw rocks? Revenge. Let's be honest. They weren't interested in justice. If they were, they would have brought the man too. But how many of us have thrown rocks in revenge? Someone has hurt us. We get, everybody's going to be hurt by the rocks. Everyone's going to face it. But guess what? You don't need to throw the rock. Jesus said, I will repay Trust in him. Let him be the one that brings justice. You can throw the rock to hide your own sin. I have found this to be true among many Christians. Have you ever noticed that the rocks that we throw are different than the sins that we personally sin? Oh, there are people that will march against certain sins, and they'll get on media, and they'll let everyone know and man they're throwing rocks they're hurling them hard but strangely enough when it comes to their sin they don't do that just because you sin differently than I do doesn't mean that I'm better than you okay the fact is you don't throw rocks because you're self-righteous you shouldn't God said very clearly that we're not to do that. And by the way, one of the most misunderstood passages of Scripture in the Bible is judge not that you be not judged. God is not saying that we should not make moral judgments or that we shouldn't judge right from wrong. He's not suggesting that. He's saying don't be self-righteous. Don't be the person that says, I'm going to throw a rock at you because you sin. Oh, you're not going to know about my sin. I'm going to pretend to be holier than thou. I'm going to pretend that I don't sin. And God hates that attitude. That's what he's talking about. You can throw a rock because you misunderstand condemnation. You know, what you and I need to learn from this story is that we are not the judge. God is. Only God I'm not the judge. You're not going to stand before me when you die, but you will stand before God. And so God wants us to understand Matthew 7, 1 through 3, I uh, said one of the most misunderstood passages of Scripture. Do not judge others so that God will not judge you, for God will judge you in the same way that you judge others. In other words, you know, we want to just, you know, really stand up against sin be careful, 
Because God says, you know, you, you may be protesting, uh, you know, a group of homosexuals. You may be protesting some other thing that you think is the most sinful thing ever. But if you use this, God says what he's going to do is he is going to use the same attitude toward you that you use toward others. Oh, maybe you didn't do that, but you're a gossip. You're, you have an unforgiving spirit. You're self-righteous, which, by the way, God says that he hates that pride. Not that he dislikes it, not that it bothers him some, not that he wishes he didn't have to see that in us, but he despises it. In fact, in Proverbs it says it's an abomination to him. So God wants you, he will judge you the same way you judge others, and he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Why then do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? I just love how sarcastic Jesus was being there. Got a little speck in the other person's eye you're going to take care of, and you're walking around with a big log. You know, when we all consider it, all of us have been forgiven much, much, much more than anyone that we can accuse. Because we have been forgiven to be made right with a holy God. And I realize that there are some people, listen, there are some people that are more moral than others. God's not denying that. When he says there's none righteous, no, not one, he doesn't mean that Hitler was just as good as Mother Teresa or Billy Graham. He's not saying that Billy Graham and, uh, and Hitler were, you know, exactly the same in their sin. What he's saying is that you cannot approach God on your own morality. That it doesn't matter how little the sin is, that separates you from God. It brings death. It brings spiritual death. Nobody is suggesting Jesus wasn't ignorant, okay, in saying these things. He wasn't like saying, oh, you murdered somebody and this little child stole a piece of candy. Kill them both. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying when it comes to our own approach to God with the rocks, we're guilty. We've been hurt by them, but what are you going to do with it? You can throw it, but he says, don't do it. Pay attention to the log in your eye before you try to get out the speck out of someone else's. Well, those are two things we shouldn't do with the rocks. Everybody hold your rock up. You're going to get hurt by rocks. At some point in your life, you're going to be hurt. You say, well, I've never been hurt. Well, just wait. It's coming. You say, well, aren't you all positive today? No. I'm just telling you that the reality of life is this. You can put it down. The reality of life is you're going to be hurt. Like I said, Jesus said it is impossible, but that offenses will come. You're going to be offended. You're going to be hurt by someone's rocks. And in response, you can throw the rocks. A lot of Christians do. Or, number three, you can give your rocks to Jesus. That's what I believe you should do. That's what the Bible says you should do. And that would be my suggestion for you. You want to be able to overcome the shame. You want to be able to overcome and take off that mask of shame. I'm talking about really living with freedom in Christ. There are a lot of people that they pretend that they have no shame. They pretend that their past doesn't bother them. They pretend that they're good. But in their heart, they know. But what you should do is give your rocks to Jesus. Romans 12, 17 to 19, don't pay back people with evil for the evil they do to you. Focus your thoughts on those things that are considered noble. Now, that's pretty good advice, isn't it? Don't dwell on the negative. Don't dwell on all that stuff. Think about the blessings of God. You ever just, just get bogged down with life like that? You know, how you doing? Oh, it's such a bad day. I lost my cell phone coverage. I couldn't get on the internet for an hour. I mean, my goodness, you ever think about how blessed we are? You ever think about the fact that, you know, in our culture, we don't have to worry about starving to death. We have to worry about dying from eating too much. We've been blessed, okay? Uh, if you own a car, you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world. 
We get all upset. I was recently talking with somebody that was having trouble with their car. And they were all upset. Oh, and I realize it can be frustrating. Okay, I, I get that. Because it never breaks down when you got plenty of time. All right? It's only when you're on your way to work or you got a deadline or whatever. But you can focus on all the bad things and that will perpetuate itself. And not only will you uh, get negative in your spirit, you're going to begin to live that way and project that. And that's what you're going to get back in life. But he says, don't pay back uh, with evil for the evil they do to you. Focus your thoughts on things that are considered noble. As much as it is possible, live in peace with everyone. It's a lot more possible than you think, okay? Now I realize that for some, the best solution is that you don't hang around them. You can love somebody in the Lord and still not want to go to the movies with them, okay? I want you to know that. Somebody might, amen, there you go, all right, so I'm hoping that wasn't directed to me, all right, so, uh, but no, seriously, the point is that uh, you've got to understand that you can live at peace with people. It doesn't mean that you are the one that just never takes a stand and never has any belief. Uh, there's a difference between being a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. God said you're blessed when you're a peacemaker. We make peace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We make peace by forgiving. We make peace by reconciling with people. A peacemaker just appeases people and doesn't ever stand for what's right. But no, God said, um, don't take revenge, dear friends. Instead, let God's anger take care of it. After all, Scripture says, I alone have the right to take revenge. I will pay back, says the Lord. Give your rights to Jesus. Now, let me, let me finish with this. What can Jesus do with a rock? You know what you and I can do with a rock? We can pummel somebody with it. We can be hurt by it. We can try to get revenge. But what does Jesus do with the rock? Well, the same as he did for this woman in the story. He can redeem it. He said, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord. And he said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Once again, he was not condoning her sin. He was showing her that repentance is the path to peace and reconciliation. Repentance is the key. Uh, he can also use the rock. Um, 2 Corinthians 1, 4. He comes alongside of us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. God can use your hurt when you give it to him. Give him the rock. Give him the rock. And then finally, he can build with the rock. I love this. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock and established my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. God wants to transform your life. He wants to give you peace. He wants you to live differently than you're used to living. You see, the point is he can build something with your rock. Give it to him. Give it to him. And then finally, Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23, and this is referring to Jesus. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I wonder if you believe that the story of the gospel, of what Jesus can do with our shame, is that marvelous to you? You start thinking about it, it is more than marvelous. It is amazing what God can do when we will give our rock to him. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have prayer. And I'm going to invite you to do something that's symbolic. I want you to take your rock and I want you to put it at the foot of the cross. I don't want you to leave here with the rock. Some of you have been hurt by the rocks. Don't hang on to that. 
For some of you, you know what you need to do when you put your rock up here? You need to release the hurt and say, God, help me to forgive. That's what you got to do. You want peace, you got to do that. You know what others need to do? You're just so angry and you're so upset about culture. You watch the news so much that instead of reading the Bible, you're upset half the time. And you say things like, well, you know what our problem is in this country? And, uh, you know, you begin to tell everybody around you, making them miserable. Well, they don't want to be around you, especially at Thanksgiving. Dad, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, uh, somebody that comes to your Thanksgiving, all right? You know what you need to do? You need to put the rocks at the feet of Jesus. Put it at the cross. Give up being a rock thrower and give it to Jesus and let him build something with it. What God wants to do with your hurt, he wants to build something with it. What God wants to do with your anger, he wants to build something with it. What God wants to do with your past, he wants to forgive you and he wants to build you as a part of the church. Now it's gonna take time and it's gonna take patience, but the key is not just letting go of the rock. The key is coming to the cross, getting to know Jesus. That is what will help you to release the hurt and release the rock to Jesus. And there may be some today that say, you know what, I need to release my rock. I need to be saved. And I would challenge you today to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Pray something like this online or in the room. Dear Jesus, here's my rock. Here's my past. Here's my sin. I ask you to forgive me. And I'm asking you to change me. Here's my rock. Here's my rock. Here's my rock. Heavenly Father, help us today to lay our rocks at your feet. 